We can't see your face. Hello, it's Friday afternoon. It's um, a lovely day in July, and welcome to a collaboration between Polyphony Arts and Hennessy Brown Music. Um, Katie and I are very pleased to welcome um, Johnny Hennessy Brown and Cressida Wislocky today to talk to us about our Hello. joint venture. Um, hello, Hi. both of you, thank you for coming. Um, yes, yeah, so we um, we have something quite exciting happening on Sunday. Um, Chris, maybe you'd like to tell us about it. Um, yes, so it's really exciting, uh, the Guitar Topia concert. So basically, we um, we both agencies have musicians playing in the concert, and it goes out at 8 p.m. on stage half, and it's just like a really beautiful varied program pieces from around the world um, from absolutely amazing talented guitarists um, you know well, I, I was thinking it's so lovely because a lot of the pieces they've chosen they've had they've kind of had free reign to play what they want and they've chosen pieces they really love and also that are very sort of personal to them or to their culture um, in a couple of cases and yeah, I think it's going to be really special. Yeah, so Katie, I mean, you, you were, well, I came into this a bit later. You and Johnny were talking. Um, you know, to talk about how we came hit on the guitars, because obviously both agencies represent quite a varied stable of musicians. Well, I think the idea that, um, that Johnny in particular came up with was that. Um, Guitarists, first of all, um, are quite used to operating as soloists or in small ensembles, so it fits well um, with the online platform um, because it's it's quite you know that's quite similar to how they would usually be performing um, in terms of collaborators, not in terms of <laughs> anything else, um, and also that it's uh, there's just such an amazing breadth of guitar repertoire and. Um, you know, that it's unusual to have a number of guitarists in one performance. So, I mean, to as a little bit of a behind the scenes type comment, what we've been thinking about um, whenever we're thinking about putting on any online performance is how to um, make this particularly interesting and not just a sort of, it's a shame it's not live, but here it is anyway, for which I totally think there's a place, don't get me wrong, it's lovely to hear music in any context. Um, online at the moment but when thinking of putting something on and hoping that people will pay to watch it it's nice to think about what we can offer that's a bit different from an in-person concert and so having five guitarists is definitely different from a usual in-person concert is that right Johnny? Yeah. Does, that, does that summarize the uh, the original thinking yeah absolutely yeah yeah and uh, I've really enjoyed you know working with you guys and sort of a, a thought turning into something that's happening and some really like creative changes that that you two have made um, at Polyphony and in introducing the idea of the conversation at the end, it's been a particularly nice experience to not have to do everything, you know. That, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, or, or, or you know, Cressida and, I, Cressida and I not to have to do anything, you know. Um, and um, yeah, you've been you've been great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we, I guess, we did sort of accident we didn't exactly have a massively structured business plan for which musicians we would choose for hennessy brown music when we first started and uh, there are 10 guitarists on the book yeah yeah um, goodness and, and we we suddenly had to say, like... oh, quick, we're gonna find some violins um but yeah, yeah. uh they're, they're all fantastic two good great quartets um and uh, you know the vida quartet and the Mella Quartet, and then and then the two soloists that you're that are on this performance, Cecilia Pereira and Amanda Cook, and you know they're they're, they're both old old friends, um, which is always nice. Um, yeah, no, I I find yeah we sort of worked our way to it. It sort of emerged organically that that was the right thing to do, wasn't it? I mean, it just kind of present in the end. It was just like well, that's the obvious thing to do. But I think also we, I think. It was a bit of a diff tricky journey because obviously, as we all know, you know, we're both agencies representing musicians, you know, the pandemic hit and suddenly everybody's work stopped. And then everyone was running around with their hair on fire going, what can we do? What can we do? Let's put stuff online. And that was a bit of a mixed blessing, really. You know, we talked about this before, mm -hmm. haven't we, about how the quality, there was so much stuff going out and some of it was good and some of it was terrible. 
And most of it was free, which is kind of great in one way, but problematic in another. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, Katie, you know Martin Kendrick, and you know he's created this fantastic pro platform, Stage Hub, where the concert's being posted, and that was a bit of a sort of godsend, a way of formalising that, a, a way of actually putting something online in a very high quality format, in a structured, on a structured site that allowed for, um, you know, that actually allowed for, you know, some kind of formality and and structure around the the way the concerts. Um, because I think one of the things, don't you agree, Krista, that actually one of the good things is the way that you can buy this content, you pay for these concerts, but then they're always there for you. So even if you miss the point at which they're streamed, of course you can go back to them. That's something else you don't get a live concert, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, we were all plunged into this world suddenly where we had to work so much stuff out about, you know, technical things and, it's just the kind of things we just musicians just don't do and so yeah stage hub's been brilliant i think it's really great because musicians can just do their artistic work they can just play their program send it in and it's also a way that they can make some money when like you said there was so much suddenly that these big consoles were putting out for free because they could do that so it was it was a tricky situation at first but Stay yeah, it's, it's a brilliant platform for this. Yeah, because we don't yeah. really approve of free, do we, Katie? <laughs> well, I think there's a place for, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about this because I know that producing music and playing music and sharing it with people is absolutely the key thing that musicians do. And when they can't do it, it's very, very, very sad and, and it's really missed both by themselves and by the people that like to listen to it. Um, so in that sense, I find it really difficult to have a problem with free music because, you know, if people want to record themselves playing and share it with their social media followers, that benefits everybody. But I think and I, my, my thoughts on this, and I don't know if the others will agree, is that um, actually that is something that has been a really good skill for a lot of musicians to learn who weren't doing it already. And it has its benefit and it, it's profile raising and um, uh, connection raising. But that actually there is a difference between that. Even when it's done really well, there is a difference between a live stream from your living room and a concert. Um, and this is where I think, I mean, my personal view, again, which might not be popular, is that I really wish that places like um, the opera houses and orchestras that have released a lot of professionally produced live, um, streamed content, online content, I wish that they had charged for that. I wish there was some kind of paywall or something because um, I just feel like it says a lot about the value of music because when you think about the cost of producing one of those videos, say an orchestral video, with 50 or 80 people playing and then all of the technical work and the venue and so on and so forth, all of that value isn't getting recognized when those videos are available free online so widely. Um, and, you know, I've seen time and again, people celebrating the fact that people have waived fees for it. Like this was in the theater, I watched a theater production um, that was available on, um, uh amazon you know the amazon um sorry i don't usually use it but i signed up to it to watch this particular play and at the beginning mm. there was this big introduction where they said oh the, the fee you've paid is all going to charity which is great and everybody who's involved in this play from the performers right down to all the technical staff and the runners and so on have all waived their fees for this being broadcast so that we can offer it all to charity and i thought that sounds so altruistic and so wonderful but I really feel for those people who have been asked to to do that. It feels really devaluing to me, and hopefully they're all you know being paid adequately so that they can afford to do it. But you know, perhaps not. Um, so I do have a lot of views about this clearly. Um, but I so I think for us, obviously, it was then a case of finding um, something that had value that was worth paying for in a world where a lot of music is free. Um, yeah. and producing that and that's what I think that we've done because and that's the other aspect of focusing on an instrument like the guitar um in choosing which artists we sh we we um asked to do this video it means that people get something that they don't get usually in a live concert where they've got um this like wealth of repertoire but also it, it highlights um 
it, you know, it provides a collaboration opportunity for the artists themselves. And that's what we were aiming at with the, the conversation that we have um, on the video after the concert. The, um, the five artists involved have recorded a conversation for us about the music. And that is just so lovely because, again, that's a collaboration that wouldn't have um, happened in a live context. Yeah. I, suppo I suppose I could um, add uh, the aspect of, of being a musician myself. Um, you know, I, as as well as running Hennessy Brown Music with Cressida, I still I still play. And um, my my sort of feeling was at first when the lockdown started, anything would do. You know, I, if I could do a Facebook Live, um, and, I, and I did. You know, and I raised money for Oakleaf in Guildford with some bark. Um, and and I and I talked one of our artists, Tim Gill, into and playing a concert which raised money for help musicians and then time went on and six weeks had gone and i hadn't made a penny from performing and uh i started to think you know well and, and but even then that the nhs felt far more significant than musicians and and so i did something for the nhs to raise money i played some crazy piece that probably made no sense but um i just made it up um, and then, you know, and, and then after that, a couple of weeks after that, I thought, well, I, I do need to eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe it's now time for, and it started to occur in the press as well, that to look at perhaps the musicians being mm. the charity, well, not a charity, but mm. people that need to be paid for what they do. Um, and because the concert halls aren't available, something like Stage Hub is, is a wonderful thing you know or, or, and it, or, yeah and it makes it acceptable in a way to charge for it you know for musicians mm. they see other people doing it and yeah it's okay mm. we can do that it's not you know i'm not going to be you know frowned upon massively by everyone and also it's a formal site rather like i imagine you know something like netflix is people with something where if mm. they know that's the purpose of it and that's the way it's structured and there's a catalog and there's like a program then mm. it's sort of, I think that the um, mindset is much more, yes, we're used to doing this. We want to see something mm. online, the, the value, and then we, we're used to, you know, paying for yeah. it. Because you you, yeah. you you dipped your toes in the water. You, were, you Before we're doing this, you had, had one of the early concerts on Stage Hub, hadn't you, with, um, I think, husband, with your husband-wife cello duo, hadn't you? Yes. Well, we, we had two so far. Um, wow. we, we also had a... Uh, the Quarteto Latino Americano, who I always say that with my silly Spanish accent. Sorry, but um, <laughs> they're, 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 um, they're, you know, they did a really nice interview um, as well. And that, so we sort of, I mean, thanks to you guys, you know, we met Martin and started up this little series of musicians in conversation. And then, yes, and Tim and Gill and Jolie Coos did a lovely cellos from home concert. And it's, it's still up there. Um, and it, you know it was it was beautiful, um, and we're doing something else soonish, you know, to try and raise money for people in Colombia, because because we were really touched by this thing we saw on Channel Four News. You know, goodness me, they've got a real lockdown, no furlough, no anything. Mm -hmm. so, so the funds from that interview are going to to the people in Colombia. But I, I know we're here to talk about Guitar Topia. Um, mm -hmm. but, yeah, well, no, yeah. I think it's clear the, the context of it, though, isn't it? And because obviously we're all learning, even even people who are have been producing a lot of online content over the last few weeks, it's, there, there are very few people in this industry that are really, you know, completely down pat with this all the time. So it's really, it's definitely uh, good, yeah, to good to know that these things are still available, you know, that these concerts, that's what I think is really lovely, is that you don't miss it, <laughs> you can't miss it now, you know, if you've missed yeah, it. Yeah, it's true. And like um, Margaret, like you were saying, it's great because it's available. You don't have to watch it there and then. So, you know, if you've got to put the kids to bed or, you know, sometimes you don't want to commit to buying a ticket for something because you just think I'm going to end up not being able to watch it. So it's perfect. It's, yeah, watch it any time. Yeah. It's been quite a for the artists as well because they've had to produce really good quality video. Now, we're quite fortunate with, our, with ours because Michael Pearl's a bit of a kind of techie person anyway. But obviously, London, the Charlie's based in London and Mark's based in Chicago. So they're actually, they're already quite on top of all the technology and doing things remotely. 
um, because their, piece, their, their section of the concert is recorded in London and Chicago. Yeah, and fantastic. Yeah. This screen. And I said to them, I'm yeah. wondering where they've even got the back of their sofas matching. I thought that was, you know, <laughs> the <continuing laughs> person had gone and go, just, Mark, could you just put a book on and you're to get it up? So oh, that kind of attention to detail, which I thought was really yeah. impressive. Yeah. Uh, but I yeah, think it's good that they, how, care, how hard they've worked at making this look, you know, make it everything about it work as well as possible. I, I've really been impressed with just how well they've done. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, under restrict, you know we're, we're still living in very restricted circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and absolutely, it does. It doesn't feel massively um, artistic to you know, to be in a in a small room on your own with no piano, and you know it's a bit like an orchestral audition scenario. Mm. You know, it's, it's very very cold, and the way they've managed to put so much expression into their playing just from their bedrooms. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very intimate. It, it's it is. It's really charming because although you know, it is. The way it is, you'd think it would feel more distant, and actually, you do sort of feel that intimacy because it's not a cat. It's not in a concert hall. We're not all dressed up in our finery. You know, we haven't got you know people bustling around sending programs. So there's that level of informality, which is actually rather charming, as though you've been kind of allowed into. You know, you've kind of been able to tiptoe in from the wings and listen to something quite special. The thing I, was... I worry about sometimes is you know if, if this really takes off. When life goes back to normal, will people want to keep having electronic concerts and not go out? Because I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be part yeah, who of knows? creating that. <laughs> but it might, it might be a hybrid experience, perhaps that we're going to move to. You know, where there'll be a concert with a live performance, and then the next weekend it's out on Stage Hub, and that, yeah. I guess that, that's a good thing, right? I think that would be a good thing. Um, I, I personally don't believe that. I believe that live performance will be um, done as much as it possibly can be, as soon as it can be, because so many people miss it so much. Mm. Um, however, I don't think that online performance is going to go away either. And I, I do think that's positive. I mean, Cressida just mentioned putting the kids to bed. I mean, when my son was, I probably didn't go out in the evening at all until my son was, I don't know, well over 18 months. You know, that's a whole chunk of people's lives where they're not able to go to concerts on an evening. And I was, you know, because we were thinking about it. Um, we think a lot about inclusive, inclusivity and accessibility. Um, and I was, you know, it's great. You know, anyone's kids could watch this concert, you know, where you might struggle to get them to go to a concert hall and maybe sit for, you know, and, and observe the, the social um, niceties. Um, kids don't do that, do they? So, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a whole access yeah, as well where, you know, it's um, really possible to kind of sit and enjoy this. I, was, I actually watched a, one of the Wigmore lunchtime concerts with my son. We didn't watch the whole thing, but watched quite probably longer of it together than I would have expected him to sit and watch music for. And he was absolutely mesmerized. And it was really lovely. Yeah. If I dragged him halfway across London and like, you know, told him he had to do this and the other, it probably wouldn't have been the same. Yeah, <laughs> much less stressful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's, I mean, it's quite clear that we're not trying to pretend one is a substitute for the other because, I mean, that yeah. is clearly not the same. But a lot of the people are going, oh, well, you know, um, it's not the same. And obviously it's not, you know, being in a concert hall having that shared collaborative experience of a performer and an audience and a living, breathing, listening audience in that moment is something you can you can't replicate. It's that's the whole point mm. of it. It's not, mm. But you know, people going on about oh well all the online stuff, we've been listening to radio forever. We've been listening yeah. to Radio Three. We've been listening to Classic FM. Nobody would dream of going, oh well it's not the same, is it? Because we go, well no, we know it's not, but it's a really mm great resource for accessing music in way mm. a lot more music than you could if you physically had to go to a concert hall every, every time you wanted yeah. to do. And and it's good for the artist too say, isn't it yeah nobody's sort of saying that seeing the analogy between oh you know let's all get excited about it going online and not being the same experience and being sort of debased and it's like but you know radio seems to be fine we all take our music different you know you can take it different ways and you can adjust you know what experience you're getting and you know what what's missing 
as in you might have that magic moment where there's just that communication between the live performer and the audience, or you could be in your car, in which case you couldn't couldn't have that, you couldn't have an experience of music unless you had the radio on. You, mm. you, you could be sitting yeah, with your toddler, you know, just about asleep in the next room, and you can put your headphones in and listen to a concert when you couldn't have gone out to the hall, and you know it's not the same. But I think yeah. it's a really exciting addition to the ways we can experience music. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's obviously no substitute, you know, like you said, that, you know, there's there's the theatre of live performance and the, the formality, and which you just won't get online. But on the other hand, you can get closer to the musicians than you ever could you know, with a live concert in some ways, you know, you're getting a real insight into the, you just, you just wouldn't normally get to chat to them or hear about the whole process they've gone through or, I yeah. think it's, when we did the Zoom Room event, it was amazing because we had people from so many different countries and you could see, you know, see everybody and there was real interaction and it did, it felt really special. It was such a good event. Was, yeah, one thing yeah, really that I wanted to talk about, actually moving on to actually talking about the performance proper, as but we've got it, is that we didn't ask our, we didn't make any suggestions to our musicians about, about what they should play. We just gave them free reign and said, you've got, you know, around 15 minutes to play with. You come up with what you want to play. And actually what has come out is the most fantastic programme without us, anybody curating it at all. I did interfere slightly and just ask them to tell each other what they were doing so that it was make sure it wasn't the same thing. <laughs> that was, oh, that yeah. was the, uh, the that. only bit of guidance. But yeah, you're that right. Awkward, <laughs> <it>? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's 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 an amazing program, isn't it? I mean uh, Yeah, definitely. I really um you know, I mean it's also a real bonus to get a, a sneak preview. Um and I've, I've had I've had that today, and um, it was I mean you know I don't want to single anyone or anything out, but I, I it's just that because I lived in Yucatan and met Cecilia over there, it, it was just so lovely to hear Peregrina again, and it was it was it was like a little little anthem for for Yucatan, and um, it reminded me of the Trova, which is like those the, the trios guitarists playing on in the main square, and um, and um, you know, apparently this governor in the 1920s um, fell in love with someone from the New York Times, and and commissioned a song, um, Peregrina, to be to be written for her. And you know, he was married, um, so it's all it's all a bit um, risque, you know. Um, but it's, yeah, it's it's just it was lovely to hear that, and and the variety from the whole concert, from from the bark through to that, and then. The amazing duo mm. tandem at the end. I mean, I, yeah, the, I mean, as you say, they're tech. Wow, no. Because Katie, we knew that there wasn't. We didn't really need to say talk to Michael because we don't want to talk to him. Because you know, Michael, you know, his big thing is Bach, and um, duo tandem just brought out a really fantastic album of music by the Turkish Cypriot um, composer Kamal Belevi and um, Nachati. Mm. London based, he's East Turkish Cypriot. So we were fairly confident they weren't going to pick the same pieces. <laughs> yeah. Was, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think what's really interesting though about the pieces that people have come up with and whether this is a indicative of what it, you know, of guitar repertoire in general or just how people are feeling during lockdown and what they're producing, but there are um folk songs anthem the kind of really, really well known tunes from um three different countries or more in this program, everyone's chosen something that's really close to their hearts and really close to the, the roots of the particular, um, uh, either country they come from or, or what the, you know, where their repertoire is coming from. The uh, duo tandems pieces are um, uh, classical, uh, rain, well, classical compositions based around 
um, really, really famous Cypriot tunes that apparently are, you know, it's like a homecoming to anyone um, from Cyprus who hears them. Um, and Michael's Bach is just this, you know, he's, he's released an album a couple of years ago now called Seven String Bach, and it's his, uh, his big thing that he performs all over. Um, and it's so beautiful and so intimate, so, so lovely to hear. And then comparing that with some of those really energetic pieces is uh it's just such a treat <laughs> it really is yeah. you know I, I enjoyed um amanda's uh gallo ciego as well that um which i've oh, never yeah. heard before you know i mean the 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 world of guitar repertoire is um something that i'm going to have to learn more and more about because we've yeah, got it's fast, 10, it? 10 guitarists on our roster um and um yeah i mean i i'd never i've got to be honest um I, i'd never heard of augustine bardi until this afternoon but apparently he's an argentinian uh, violinist pianist and composer and um he sort of died before world war ii was finished and it and it, and it, it sounded to me as if it was just stunning tango writing and uh, and it yeah. reminded me of a little discussion we had with the um quarteto latino americano which is you know do you need to be argentinian or latin american to to really pull off that kind of music uh and um they had d varying answers from the quartet but it, in amanda cook's case it would appear not um no absolutely uh and then it's yeah yeah, yeah. it's um it's funny like uh william lovelady i saw that name and i thought i assumed it was like someone from the renaissance period or something <laughs> and actually it's a contemporary composer <laughs> You know, he works with Julie Lloyd Webber and Art Garfunkel, and but yeah, it's been very educational for me as well. This this program, and is it ha Roland Deans? Deans, is that how you say it? Um, yeah, one of the pieces, Songs Capricorn, that Manda plays. It's gorgeous. I love that piece. It's mm. really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's great. The, just yeah. the arc of the the concert is so beautiful. So you start with this very very, you know, classic classical Bach piece. You know, just absolutely gorgeous um you know very contemplative exactly you know what you want from bark which is always like you know a great cool drink of water and then amanda comes in with this fabulous fabulous selection you know which, which spans wow. so many different styles and that really sets the scene and then chino comes in and he plays mozart and then he takes it right back to his own home which i think is just fantastic and then, of course, that leads you into Duo Tandem, who are doing, you know, this Turkish city stuff that's so close to, you know, Nachati's heart. And um, just, I think, the arc of the concert, you know, without trying, as I say, without really trying to curate it, other than say, guys, try not to do the same thing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, we, it couldn't have worked better. I mean, if we'd sat down in committee and tried to work out a programme, we would never have come up with something as good as this, I, I think. That's true. I wonder if that might be a, a a little sign for the future that um committees could say to the musicians, would you like to choose what you do? Yeah, <laughs> if only. Because yeah. who knows more than musicians really, you know, about mm -hmm. about the music that they're playing. And obviously yes. there are themes to festivals and you know and so on, but I know I can I, I sometimes take issue with that because I can sometimes get a bit tired and I say oh what what's the theme for this concert going to be it's like oh for crying out loud does that have to be, really does it and it's all got to well you know does it all balance one of the best concerts I went to was when I was living in Boston it was the Boston Symphony Orchestra and it, this was the program Ligeti a Haydn symphony the Rite of spring now, no one who was trying to create a themed or some guy would ever dream of putting those three things together. It's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. So. Okay. Uh, great. Lovely. Um, I was wondering if uh, Hennessy Brown, I was just thinking about coming to the end of this and our usual plugs that we usually do about what's coming up <laughs> next. I was wondering if Hennessy Brown Music have anything else you'd like to plug besides obviously this concert, which we hope all of you watching will definitely um, sign up for. Go on, Chris, you do a plug. I'm always uh, well, doing it. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, have, um, our, we have our interview with two con conductors, um, Ricardo Jaramillo from Colombia, and Simon Chalk, who is the artistic director for Southern Symphonia over here. Um, and since we did the interview, Simon, as Johnny mentioned earlier, Simon saw this documentary on Channel 4 about um, 
a desperate situation for people in Bogota. They were putting red flags outside their doors when they'd run out of food. Um, and so we've, we're putting proceeds from ticket sales towards that charity now. Um, there's somebody on the ground that's handing out food parcels that we're in contact with. Um, so yeah, that's coming up. What is what date is it again? Is it August the second, Johnny? Oh, it's in my diary. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's a week from Sunday. Watching this, Simon, can you help us? We can yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> Put it in the comments. <laughs> it's the yeah. Hub. Yeah, it, is, it is the second on Stage Hub. Yeah, conducted in conversation. Yeah, lovely. Mm. So that's the next thing. Yeah, after the guitar concert, Johnny. Is there anything else? Well, well, we hope that there's going to be a Hennessy Brown music concert series. Um, well, yeah, but we're Might still waiting. Like. What what could one say? Um, clear guidance, <laughs> uh, you know, um, and and looking at ways yeah. to do it, as so many orchestras and concert series are. You know, we might have to August do. The August, August the second. August the second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But, um, I'm sure it's about that day. Yeah, August. There is an. There is also an interview with two um, sort of. Um, there's they're kind of Spanish pop stars, really, aren't they? Antonio de yeah. Haro, um he plays with Pablo Albarán. So I had to do the whole interview in Spanish. Um, that, that's going out on Stage Hub too. I've no idea if I make sense. I, I tried, um, but so uh, yeah, there'll, there'll be subtitles. Yeah. How about you guys? So, yeah, what's going on with Liffany? What's Liffany doing next? Um, well, I've just been on holiday for, well, I say holiday loosely. I've moved <laughs> out. It was a mistake to refer to that in my mind as a holiday um, because it wasn't. <laughs> It was a time of not working and dealing with things to do with plumbing and other unpleasant things um, and lots and lots of cardboard boxes. So I'm a little out of touch on exactly what we've got come up coming up on our live series and so on. But um, big picture wise, we are launching a podcast and um, I am going to be working on that and the content for it. And as I said a couple of times already, um, it's, it's basically going to be focusing on the future of classical music with a variety of angles so music business contemporary music and new music essentially and how that's uh, how that's um comes together with other music um Excellent. and music education and so yeah any um uh, anyone who's listening and wants to suggest specific specific things that you'd like us to cover on that are definitely open to ideas um and going to releasing more information about that soon yes that's exciting i'm looking forward to that because obviously i've been doing on part of these lives i've been doing a regular wednesday comedy evening called going viral which i'm hoping we can sneak bits of that into the podcast <laughs> um yeah, we're probably gonna, we're probably going to pause that over august um but uh you know and then we'll we'll bring it back but i think it's you know i think that's I've got there's something else I've got up my sleeve in terms of what Polyphony Arts is doing. Um, it's sort of kind of coming off the Black Lives Matter and a lot of the conversations about um, uh, conversations about you know black musicians, not just black composers, black musicians represent under representation. Um, Daffodil had a really interesting um, conversation with um, oh god, I think it was. Brand, was it Brandon? Anyway, it was it was a really fantastic one about tokenism and exceptionalism. That everyone there's always like one black composer, like Florence Price, you know, um, Sheikh Ukana Mason. Everyone looks in like, oh, you know, we've got black, and it's that set. And but where are the black conductors? Where are they? And so one thing we've yeah. done is we're actually going forward rather than doing a kind of big flurry about the Black Lives Matter things now. Um, I've actually created a list of. Um, music by black composers and it'll move into black musicians which is already as long as your arm and i'm thinking god i'm 61 i've been playing in orchestras since i was pretty much six i cannot think i've ever once played a piece by a black composer this is insane yeah. um so amazing. releasing one i think rather than just make a big thing we're just going to drop it you know once a week um put one and post one of these on our facebook pages just to kind really? of really out there right. there's some fantastic okay as well oh my god so Margaret, do you know um i saw uh, you know roderick cox the conductor black conductor i watched um there was a fascinating interview where he interviews three other black conductors 
um i found it i think it's on his facebook one of his facebook pages it's so interesting oh, i must see that really, i'll send you the link to it yeah, yeah. I, mean, also, I, think, yeah, I think there are things that can be done um, behind the scenes there, where, you know, uh, as music managers and, you know, when we're uh, trying to fix an orchestra or even perhaps getting funding for a project for something coming up, you know, I will always stipulate that there's a, there's a fair percentage of A, women and B, black and Asian players. And it, it's not, it's not, you know ticking boxes it's it's something yeah. i've believed in since i was a tiny kid i thought well, you know what's going on where's the, the yeah the, these people aren't represented in our industry and um i think if well, that's you know, what sorry go on, Craig. No, it's fine go no ahead. i was going to say that's what one of the people said in this in this interview they said when you don't see a black conductor up there as a little boy when you go to a concert you just don't it doesn't come into your it's just something you're not going to do you know it, it's not in your realm of thinking and it was yes it need people need that what they need to see yeah brandon that keith brown that's who it was i always get kind of slightly panicked around names and then yeah brandon keith brown and he was he was really good on the daffodil project so i think wow. i think we're all trying to do stuff you know we can't there's not a lot we can do to get stuff going live now so we've all had to really put our you know sit scratching our heads with a fork chewing mm. fork um, mm. to really think about how we can keep profile going for our artists and do, and it's been good for us, wouldn't you say, Katie? We've really had to be quite agile and creative in terms of what can we do? And it's really made us expand our thinking and the kind of conversations we've been having. So that's got to be good. I mean, obviously, we'd like to be getting money for our artists. But from that point of view, I think it's actually been a really creative time, you know, mm. necessity being the grand mm. convention. Definitely. I think we've also highlighted a lot of problems with the industry, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's like the the gig economy and so on. It you know, it just goes to show how much it relies on, you know, the venues rely on the artists, rely on the venues, rely on the funders, rely on, you know, the audiences, etc. And when people can't meet in spaces en masse, the whole thing falls apart and um but yet people don't stop wanting access to the arts. So, you know, just, I think that the, the the industry can and hopefully will learn a lot of lessons from, from how important it's been and how difficult it's been to keep things going and, you know, the nuances of what that means to people. Absolutely. I mean, I would, nev I would never compare musicians to NHS workers, you know, in, in, in recent times, but I was amazed at how people kept going. And, you know, we all did our little, our little bit here and there. And the Thursday night tradition of after the applause, musicians up and down the country would, you know, were playing in their cul-de-sac or their block of flats or wherever, um, somewhere over the rainbow, um, you know, and it was, everybody was doing it and they just, musicians want to play. And, and I think that's why it's even more important not to exploit that, you know. Like, yeah, we know you want to play. It's fantastic. You can do this and this, but why don't you look at perhaps playing a concert twice and then doing a Zoom concert the next weekend and making as much money as you did before? Um, mm. And just, just helping them, guiding them, and like like Margaret says, just being as as creative as possible um, to keep things afloat because we're not going to be playing to seven hundred people or you know West End shows packed for some time. Mm. It? Yeah. And it, it may also level the playing field a bit because music funding has been so London-centric. I mean, I've been working with the Fabian Society on the, the they're bringing a report out, I hope it's in August, on community, the importance of, new, of arts in the community. And the mm. funding, I mean, it's like per capita in London, they get £73. And in the West Midlands, it's like £12 per head on average mm. For every £73 that somebody in London has spent on the arts, there's just, there's less than £20 average in the rest of the country. You know, and with if, if this is the kind of thing that's happening, with a bit of luck, that might even out a bit, that it's less location-specific in that way. I think that would be interesting. Anyway, Sunday, Guitartopia. This is, this, is why we're, this is what we're here. Um, 
really to promote and to talk about because uh, we're very excited about it. I actually got a phone call last night. I was sending marketing out. I got a phone call from the loveliest lady who runs the Bromley U3A Guitar Society um, right. asking how she could get online, being really excited about it and, and wanting to share it with her members, but she's not very tech, you know, she's not a very techie person. Um, and it was so nice. She said, this is so exciting. And I'm, I got your email. And this sounds absolutely wonderful. Um, and can oh, I get some card details to log in? Because I don't know how to do it. And I'm like, no, oh. you can't. <laughs> I promise you, I wouldn't do it. It's like, you shouldn't be doing this in prison. Yeah. Here's but my national insurance number. So, I mean, it was just the <laughs> nicest thing having this call going, Oh, I can believe it. This is so exciting. I'm sending it to all my group, and we're really excited Excellent. about it. But he thought, Hang on, this is a real thing. This is actually a real thing. Oh, absolutely. I think it's so exciting. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can, you know, that we can spread that excitement and that people watching or who are aware of the, um, the concert can share it amongst people they know as well. And as much, you know, no one really likes talking about money that much. And, and you know, there are some people who are probably looking at it and thinking why are they charging when there's so much free music but i just feel really strongly that it's important to get the message out that there is a reason why we're doing this and it's really important and that if you support this concert you not only get to watch a fantastic musical event but you also get to contribute to the livelihood and and sort of like well-being and purpose of musicians which has been really really decimated in these times and there's no real kind of way of, uh, of saying that other than to say it like this really um so you know i do hope that um that you will share and share that message because it's really it's really close to my heart anyway yeah i agree so and it is and it's special you've got you've got five fantastic i mean international standard you know internationally recognized guitarists playing together you you would never get them together on the same concert stage. And then, to, then there's the conversation afterwards, um, which is mm -hmm. terrific. And then after that, after I said, right, okay, we finished because I had sort of hosted the conversation. And then they got into this really even more relaxed chat about technical stuff and strings and all this stuff. And then at the end, the chat, he said, we should keep that in. We should keep that in. So, you oh, know, I think, yeah. he said, because that's actually oh, when we really that started talking guitar. We really started talking guitar. <laughs> You know, it's yeah, always like a movie. It's, 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 it's like definitely said, a real oh, community, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, the, let's do it. The guitar oh, thing is, excellent. the classical guitar world is a, is definitely a thing. And, you know, um, I, I know there are lots of Facebook groups and, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, fan, it's fantastic. There's yeah, so much variety. Yeah. The link is in the comments right there. So follow the link, um, pay your £7.95 Um Good God, that's um, yeah, that's not. You okay. couldn't even get a cup of tea and a millionaire shortbread. Not even nowadays. Um, <laughs> not saying you shouldn't get two bottles of wine from Aldi and enjoy the concert even more. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> yes, and if you do, please do that. And also, we'd love to hear what you, those of you who do watch the concert, we hope you all do. Um, we really would love to hear what you think about about the experience because. Mm, you know, that that would that be really important. I mean, the lovely lady from Bromley. I mean, you know, I've had some lovely chats with her, and she was. And I said, you know, it'd be really nice actually. If, you know, afterwards, you could tell us what you and your members thought, because this is a bit of a kind of you know shot in the dark for us as well. And to actually hear from people, who, you know, who are not connected to us, but have you know sort of paid your money and watched it. So that would be really yeah. nice. It's great to get feedback, isn't it? Because it, it, yeah. it's not always a very English thing to say what we don't like or, you know, yeah. what, what we didn't think went well. But, I mean, as we can only learn by being told, you know, what, what the mm -hmm. consumer didn't enjoy as well as what they did enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That would be good. Lovely. So there is one technical thing um, yeah. that we've experienced from the first one we put on with, uh, Tim Giller, Jolie Coos, which was you do have to subscribe to Stage Hub in order to buy it, but but it's it's not um, any kind of you know um, long term thing. You're not going to be getting a newsletter and loads of emails from them. It's just the way it's set up is you need to subscribe and then watch the trailer and buy it. Yeah, no, um, you don't have to. It doesn't involve any money changing hands. It's like no, exactly. 
you know, if I buy stuff from John Lewis, I have to have an account to do it. You know, it doesn't cut the account mm -hmm. cost me anything, but it's the it's your way in. And in the hopes that, you know, if you establish that, then, you know, you've got access for more things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So wonderful. Well, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. I'm all worried I'm going to be looking at go, I said that. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, John. Thank thank you. You. Kate, I'm glad you managed to join us because we know it's a bit squeaky this afternoon. We won't show you this, but I'm glad you did. I'm glad not to get any boxes in this exact frame. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the house. So, so um, yeah. Um, right. yeah, so watch Polyphony Arts. I don't think we've actually got the, there'll be the last going viral before September next Wednesday. I'm not sure we've quite decided who we're going to stick it to. It was Janacek this week. Um, and I'm not sure we'll we'll probably think of something. Dale and I will think of something. And uh, But we'll be posting early next week um, what our programme is coming up. Yeah. Um, and otherwise, we hope we'll you'll be with us. Um, when we are all in our separate little bubbles watching Guitartopia on Sunday at eight o'clock or any time thereafter when the kids are asleep um, and the drinks cabinet door has creaked. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all. And um, so we wish you well and um, hope to see you then. Nice thank to see you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. See you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.